any business to automatically make a transaction carbon neutral. So a lot of the, I believe all three other founders on this or, or kind of folks on this call, um, their business is primarily focused on decarbonization or preventing pollution at all. And that's kind of what we view as like step two of this climate equation, where the first is you actually have to understand your climate or environmental impact. Uh, the second is you have to reduce that environmental impact. That's where the decarbonization piece comes in. So once you maybe understand your footprint, you can take active measures to move to renewable energy or consume less or travel less, whatever that might mean for, for your particular business. And then finally, the last piece is the removal component. And that's where Patch really puts the most of our attention, where we make it incredibly easy to programmatically remove any amount of CO2 from the atmosphere. The way we do that, is we partner with a wide variety of what are called carbon removal and carbon offset developers. Those are the players you see on the right side. So from something as familiar as reforestation, where photosynthesis actually sequesters carbon and biomass in a tree, to something as foreign as direct air carbon capture, where you can actually run uh, ambient air through a solvent, capture that CO2 and store it safely. We partner with all of these organizations and make their capacity available via an API uh, for those who don't know, an API is how computers communicate with one another. And so what we're typically doing is working with a wide variety of companies, primarily technology enabled companies across e-commerce, uh, banking and payments, climate tech. Some, we actually have some things in crypto kind of in the background um, to actually allow them to create either climate positive, carbon neutral, net zero products and services. Um, you know, the kind of additional piece going on behind the scenes is there's a huge amount of data when it comes to carbon markets and Patch's interface actually normalizes all that. So you'll see on the right here, we have a uh, a fake biochar project. We don't actually work with Mordor, but that's kind of for illustrative purposes. We capture all this different metadata by ingesting information from verification standards, registry systems. Sometimes we actually bring in third party consultants to evaluate the way carbon is sequestered. Uh, and then we actually standardize it and make it available through a singular interface. And this actually allows people to create um, carbon neutral credit cards or carbon neutral crypto exchanges or doing things related to um, uh, related to um, e-commerce with carbon neutral shipping. And so at a high level, that's Patch, uh, you know, founded about 15 months ago, partnering with a really wide variety of businesses with kind of our first kind of tranche of you know, 10 to 15 customers that are gonna be coming out in the public in the next couple couple of months uh, with, a, with a bit of press. So that's Patch. Uh, I imagine we'll wanna we'll leave questions to the end. So I wanna leave time for everyone else. So maybe I'll just pause there and we can we can circle back if, the, if anyone has any questions. So I'm gonna try Thanks. unsharing my screen. Thanks, Brennan. And it's amazing you guys have only been up for about 15 months. That's, in, that's really uh, something. Lots yeah, of well, I, well uh, you know, the, the you know, as fun as moving fast is, the unfortunate reality is we don't have very much time as a as a species, really. And so time really is of the essence. So we're 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 doubly motivated, if you will, both from maybe a financial outcome or business outcome, as well as the kind of environmental outcome we're trying to race towards. So as we I'll all pass need the mic to. back to you. Katie. Thank you. All right, Cedric, back to you. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, much better. Apologies for internet connections in this part of the world. No um, but yeah, um, uh, Three Worlds United, uh, I'll just talk a little bit more about what we do. So uh, on a very high level, we want to help uh, the 175 million uh, two and three wheeler drivers uh, all drive electric. How do we do this? The core of it is really using technology and finance um, to enable ownership, uh, whether being ownership of, fleet, uh, of fleets or ownership, uh, individual ownership. Um, through technology, we have uh, understood that, um, well, these drivers typically from informal uh, economies uh, have a daily uh, habit of payments, and we've built technology to understand um, and incentivize better repayment habits. Uh, we deploy capital uh, uh, for drivers who uh, fit the profile for which we, 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 go, we, we go for. Uh, but in addition, we're more than just a financier. So we build tools to ensure that um, the operations of that vehicle is seamless and profitable for the driver and that it, it benefits the driver, uh, particularly in solving for problems around charging. So we show them live charging points that exist. India uh, has 200 million homes. Um, a lot of these homes have charging points and the intention is to partner with every uh, charging person or home that allows us to do that. And 
uh, indicate where a charging point is. We go as far as solving for uh, range anxiety by notifying drivers when their vehicles are running down and the nearest charging point they could go to. Um, we also partner with um, uh, ride hailing aggregators to ensure that uh, they get a stable revenue over the entire period of uh, life of the loan, and this could run for uh, three, four years. Um, at the core, we're financiers, like I mentioned, uh, but we've simplified it. We give people loans which finance up to 100% of the vehicle cost. And for the people who haven't uh, or who don't believe yet in the uh, electric dream, we let them drive the vehicles for a few months and make a decision to buy later. So at, at the core of this, uh, the intention is really that we make owning an EV the simplest and most profitable venture a driver would want to have. Right. Uh, we've done this for about 4,000 drivers. Um, uh, recently, India just got lifted off its uh, second wave of COVID. Uh, just last month, we've deployed an additional 500. We're growing rapidly. Uh, and the intention is to have uh, 10,000 vehicles next year, uh, about 100,000 in, uh, 100, in three years. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, even just in a uh, country like India. But what our goal is is really to normalize driving an electric vehicle and from that point other partners would either learn from us or adopt our technology and scale this uh, worldwide amazing cedric and i'm curious um what is the inf the charging infrastructure look like right now uh well it's uh it's quite like every nascent market um there's bits and pieces being done by um everybody so the government has a few there are um, select companies who are deploying quite a bit uh larger companies like uh, ola have uh, are starting to deploy quite a large uh, a large fleet but largely if you look at it um there are two types of uh well the uh, like in every uh, market i think largely india and china we have the home charging as well as the battery swapping. Uh, right now, most vehicles are predominantly home charging. So we just, uh, what we do largely is enable people who already have charge points and parking spaces to map it out so that someone can use it and they can make money from it. And that is really how we, we go around uh, the charging. But there is more and more uh, companies coming up with uh, solutions around this as well as uh, the government as well doing some stuff. Great. Interesting. Jeffrey, how about you? Yeah, great, thanks. I'm gonna just share uh, a slide, some, a couple of slides real quick. Let's see. Can we see? Uh, can we see my slides? It looks like looks great. Great. Looks good. Thank you. So yeah, like I said, we're uh, so we're a non-disruptive, really highly scalable solution. Um, we're developing that we feel like it will be a you know total game changer for reducing uh, the uh, the carbon footprint of buildings. Um, our core tenant at Next is really. Uh, that windows and glass facades have a tremendous potential to help move buildings and entire cities really to net zero energy emissions. Windows play a huge role in our lives. They're currently being um, underutilized. And by integrating transparent solar cells at the point of window manufacture into new uh, windows, um, we can really tap into a huge new market for on-site solar generation um, and unlock, you know, a new paradigm of electricity and its relationship to the built environment. And it's important because buildings um, consume about 40% of the world's energy um, and about 40% of uh, the um, attendant greenhouse gas emissions. So buildings are nearly half the carbon uh, in a problem uh, that's driving climate change and representing nothing short of an, you know, ex um, existential uh, threat to humanity. And so, what we're doing is we're giving um, you know the glass in your building something new to do, um, generating electricity. And so we're actually revolutionizing the building facade market. Previously, it's been a a passive element, um, and we're turning that into an active, functional part of the building's performance to deliver uh, tremendous value. You know uh, that's grounded in sound economics to uh, to companies up and down the window and the glazing value chain. Um, what separates us is that we make a solar module that looks and functions like a window. Um, 
We do this by absorbing UV and IR light and allowing the visible light to pass through. We also significantly reduce the cost of the solar module by seamlessly um, eliminating the um, encapsulation costs of solar uh, by um, printing directly onto window glass. It turns out that an insulated glass unit or a laminated unit, uh, as you see here in the diagram, is a perfect environment for our solar material, and you don't need all that packaging that you would have to otherwise build around a solar technology. So piggybacking off of existing window architecture, um, it provides a key dual use for us, which significantly lowers the um, incremental cost of a next window. So you're seeing here on the slide on the right, a photo of a window wall that we just delivered uh, to a customer uh, in France. You can see our you know, approach really does not negatively um, impact the occupant's ability to view the outdoors. You know, we're delivering a product that's you know, truly transparent, um, uncompromised aesthetics for the sector that will allow us to um, you know, scale um, uh, you know, profitably and sustainably. So we're executing on a go-to-market strategy for capturing um, a leadership position in this market. Our approach is to um, integrate our technology into uh, the product offerings of legacy brands that are trusted and reputable that already have you know, a solid track record and warranties. And so this piggybacking strategy allows us to stay capital efficient as we scale our technology more quickly um, you know, in established brands and market channels. We have our first um, joint development licensing agreement in place. They're an um, equity stakeholder in our last two financing rounds, and we're working very closely with them um, on uh, uh, the commercialization of the technology. Our business model is to sell our technology, our materials, and uh, uh, the coding services uh, to glass manufacturers and window fabricators through license agreements. Uh, we get nice recurring revenues derived from royalties based on the volumes of windows incorporating our technology um, and, uh, and the uh, ink sales uh, to glass fabrication partners. The market's huge. There's 6.2 billion square feet um, of commercial IGUs just in the new build and major renovation segments. So that's a $50 billion uh, target market that's growing 5% a year. If you look at the US alone, it's over $4 billion, over which 90% of all the windows um, have some you know, low-E coating on them. So even a, a you know, conservative ramp rate and a modest market penetration in a market of this size represents significant you know, carbon saving potential. So if we were to replace the 6.2 billion square feet of window glass sold each year with our, our photovoltaic glass, it would amount to over one gigaton of, um, of the carbon removed by 2050. There's also aftermarket applications for our tech. While it's currently not our focus, our core technology can be easily tweaked uh, for um, existing building stock. Um, so there's tremendous you know, uh, potential. Really our mission, uh, you know, we wanna be the defining technology solution for building decarb. Uh, the technology that enables windings, uh, windows to power buildings that can serve humanity now and for really, you know, a long time into the future. So essentially, that's next. And I look forward to answering uh, for the questions about the technology and our approach. Thank you. Hey, Jeffrey, are you mainly focusing on new builds or also retrofits um, in terms right of now, strategy? It's, it's, it's new build and major renovation because we embed inside new windows. So as new windows are being made, we embed into that fabrication process. So primarily, in, unless a, a building is getting a full, you know, new building skin um, on the building, we'll go into new construction. That's our core market. There are, as I, as I alluded to, there are aftermarket applications, but it requires a um, ultra barrier that could be applied to windows aftermarket. Right now, that ultra bear is very costly, so the market is, you know, tentative. This is a much more, you know, cost-effective approach because we're kind of going right in as new windows are being made. So it's a very right. low, you know, capex, you know, sort of process. And I know you were part of the Kelsey program. Are you guys starting in California, or is it broader, a broader ge geographic focus? So we we were not Kelsey. We're um, currently doing the Cal test bed. Oh, Cal uh, you know, program, yep. and then we just were awarded uh, a a bridge grant from the CEC as well. Awesome. So we are um, we are scaling through you know California. You know we're based in Santa Barbara. I don't know if I mentioned that, but the uh, the technology spun out of UC Santa Barbara's materials department. Um, so we license you know the core technology from there and are you know commercializing the technology with partners in the industry. Great, and let's talk about Ready Olu. Okay. Hi, Emilio. 
Okay, yeah, perfect. So I'm gonna also quickly share my screen just to like take you through um, what we do at Ready. Um, sorry, just give me a second. Um, yeah. Can you see my screen now? Can you see my screen now? We we can, although it's black. Oh, oh. Sorry. Let's see. Let me, let me try that again. Um, okay. Can you see it now? Now we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, um, again, what we do at Ready is, um, Ready is, we're a little bit different because we operate um, printing in the emerging markets and our focus is more on like energy assets. And what we do, what we try to do is to, um, from the name, is to provide electricity that just like ready to go and just ready to, you can just pick it up and use it right away. Um, so like our goal as a company is to actually provide um, portable and good like electricity to houses and businesses, uh, specifically operating the energy regions of the world. And this is because um, currently now we have more than six, under one billion people globally living with access to power actually. Um, in Africa, we have over 600 million of them in Africa. And now we have another 300 million people are connected to the grid, but they struggle with live electricity. Um, so um, in Nigeria alone, which is um, my own country, we have more than 70 million out of um, 200 million people would have no access to electricity. Uh, we have another 18 million that are connected to the grid, but they struggle with live electricity. And um, overall, um, a report from the, um, the Nigeria Economic Summit Research reveals that 14 billion US dollars is spent annually by Nigerians to generate power production electricity in one way or the other. And this is what we are trying to solve with, uh, with Ready. Um, and what we try to do is to, like I said, we spend a lot of time exploring how to, how to build, we spend a lot of time um, exploring why people have not uh, adopted some of the solutions that are presented to the market. And this includes, I, I always term these solutions, emergency solutions. And what we try to do is to build a solution that, play, that adapts to um, people's lifestyle. And that's what led to the development of our systems. And this includes like, we have the ready capsule, which is our core system. We, we, um, it's like a small device that you can use to um, to generate both AC and DC power. Um, it has a 250 watt hour peak capacity. It's um, it's just like an energy storage device, but can be moved around so that it's flexible. Uh, we have a, we have a crate which is some which, which is used to transport the capsules, and uh, we have like the ready energy station where these capsules are charged. These stations are strategically located now in, in our operating communities, and they are they are solar powered. So I'm going to take you quickly take you through how people how these systems integrate together. So we have um, ready ready caps, which is uh, just our simple device. I recharge at ready and I recharge at ready energy station, which are like I said, they're strategically located in our operating communities. We have um, ready ambassadors, so we have these local ambassadors. These ambassadors are either local business owners, local mom and pop shops in our operating communities. They collect these charge capsules um, for rent from the from the energy station for rent out through the ready energy crates. And we have users come to these ambassadors to, to rent the capsule for a daily rental fee. Like I said, one of our, our business model is basically a renting. Um, it's more of like kind of a battery swap model. And um, customers just, all these products are managed. So we build a technology that allows customers to, that allows us to like manage all this process through customers' mobile devices. Um, and like I said, again, we have um, a lot of people that have adopted our systems. And one of them include um, um, Olabi in Lagos, who um, the Baba in Lagos that adopted the ready capsule, and what you have seen is you have seen um, over 30 percent energy savings when you adopted the ready capsule, as opposed to using um, using petrol generator, which is something that is very common in in, in Nigeria, but it's obviously very also very expensive to to run and to maintain. Uh, we've also seen um, a, a tailor in Lagos who have also adopted the ready capsule and used the ready capsule to actually access 24/7 electricity um, um, through the capsule. Like I said, right now we power up over 600,000 businesses. Our goal is to reach 5,000 before the end of the year. Uh, we have students use ready capsule to like run daily activities. We have gig workers in Nigeria use ready capsule to like power a couple of their systems. So the capsule is also designed to be modular. So we have people that need more energy, um, that need more um, energy, um, could actually power, combine the capsules together for more energy operation. So that just makes the capsule very flexible and very, very adaptable to their lives. And the beauty of the capsule is also the fact that um, you don't necessarily have to have money so you don't yeah you don't you don't actually have to have that upfront fee um to purchase the capsule you can just quickly walk up to a ready ambassador um they, they onboard you through our technology that would technology that we built due diligence technology that we built you do, and you can rent through that so automatically anybody irrespective of their socioeconomic background 
could access um, electricity with the ready capsule. So this is an example of somebody, um, an ambassador, and, um, somebody coming to rent the capsule from an ambassador. So that's basically about ready capsule. Um, and our, our capsule itself offsets more than 160 kilogram of CO2 um, over the light, over one year, um, over one year, over a yearly in our operating communities. And um, we designed it to be very durable, um, using like kind of military grade manufacturing to design the whole system for durability across rental. So yeah, that's um, a little about it. And for the business model, like I said, it, we are going to call rent house. We also sell cars sometimes, but like um, we have credit facilities for people that want to buy and that don't, 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 can't buy on the go. But our major our major operation is just rent the capsule and we also generate a revenue through advertisement placement on the body of the capsule. Thank you. Great, thanks, Olu. And I wanna remind the audience, if you have questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and uh, have a, a couple more questions that I'd like to get through first. Um, Brennan, are you, I don't see your picture. Are you there? Oh yeah, I'm here. Can you not hear me? Uh, I can hear you. I can't see you. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Well, I'm here. I'll, I'll check okay. in the video. Feel free to ask cool. me a question. I'll come, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, I want to ask you guys about adoption and barriers to adoption. Um, a lot of the companies that I work with are, you know, kind of right at that place where they're ready to scale and they're trying to get people to adopt them at scale, not just in sort of pilots here and there, but but to move towards broad adoption. Um, and I'd love to hear your perspectives on the challenges that you're seeing to, to really cross over to broad adoption and, and what strategies you're using around it. Uh, who wants to, to take that? Take it. Jeffrey, yeah, jump in. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, building integrated solar, it's been on, you know, the cusp of adoption for what seems like a decade or two. Um, and a few of the barriers we see um, that are pretty evident. One is, you know, there's this gulf between the building and the solar industry. So like unlike traditional solar energy generation, architectural solar generation is, it depends on the cooperation and, you know, the, the, the collaboration of numerous stakeholders. Um, and success really relies heavily on, you know, buy-in from the building owner, from architect, uh, you know, construction companies, the glaziers, building envelope suppliers, uh, you know, civil engineers and so forth. So, um, you know, there really hasn't been any real supply chain to support BIPV solar in the U.S. That's changing a little bit. Um, um, and so what, you know, because what essentially what we're doing is we're combining the window and the energy subsystem of a building into one. So uh, you need to integrate those two supply chains to really kind of you know, prime the market, you know, prime the pump for, you know, a lot of the projects you could do. Um, and then, you know, even more significantly, you know, the construction industry has been reluctant to really embrace BIPV solar because there's uncertainties about the reliability of the warranties, you know, that are provided by, you know, some of these companies that are, you know, pretty nascent, it's a nascent industry. You know, over the past few years, um, the birth of solar energy markets, it's been pretty turbulent and uncertain. Um, a lot of companies failing, succeeding, uh, but to sum up, you know, what some of the conversations we have, you know, with uh, the building industry is they, it's hard for them to accept a 20 year warranty from, you know, a company that's only been in business for six months. So that sentiment's kind of being, you know, echoed um, across, you know, the value chain. And so what we're doing to do, what we're doing to address that is we're working with the industry to integrate our windows into their framing systems, to embed our technology into you know the the legacy brands um, that are trusted and reputable that already have a solid track record and warranties um, to make you know that purchase decision that much easier um, for the building owner. And then finally, you know, BIPV solar it's been pretty ugly. It's been you know the aesthetics have been pretty bad because they're relying on you know first generation opaque black solar cells. They're shoving those into windows and saying, hey, look at my you know solar window. Well, it stops becoming a window once you can't see through it. So they've been ugly. So market adoption has been um, has been you know limited in that sense. And so we're obviously um, you know addressing that with um, a technology that's seamless and transparent. Great. That's that's really interesting. And and it'd be really I'd, I'd love to hear Cedric and Alu just kind of what the market looks like for you. Are there strong tailwinds? pushing your technologies forward or or do you feel a lot of headwinds? I guess in Nigeria especially, interesting, you know, interesting market to be innovating in given 
so much of the economy is reliant on fossil fuels right now. So do you have a, a, a broad audience uh, looking for this or are you, are you facing some strong headwinds? Okay, for, for Nigeria specifically, um, there's been, I mean, there's been a lot of like, we've got a lot of like support from the government and from the ecosystem. Um, there seems to be a very solid um, support, um, both from corporate, um, even big energy firms in Nigeria supporting um, clean technologies and even like um, government creating a lot of systems to just accelerate the adoption of these systems. So there's been, there's been a lot of support in Nigerian. Um, I think the challenge is always going back to like, um, it's like where you're introducing something very new. Um, there needs to be a lot of like education. Um, like for us, one of the challenges we have sometimes, it's always like, um, because, the, because of the way our energy system is, is designed and because of the way our business model is designed, we get some, we get, um, some kind of resistance sometimes from the market. So it's not, it's not specifically about the support there, it's about like the, the, the market embracing your solution. And people are just not used to like the rental, the sharing the economy. People are used to just like buying things and like going out of it. So, um, there's, there needs to be obviously some kind of what we are trying to do now is to just like ramp up more education. We just try to educate the market, try to inform them about the about the value of these systems and why it's like specifically designed for them. And yeah, and just to jump in uh, on the Indian side, well, I think the story is completely different. I think well, the Indian government has a target to uh, take all of its uh, vehicles um, electric by 2030. Which is, which is quite ambitious, but they've been doing a lot around uh, policies, around taxes, around the prices of this vehicle to really uh, drive adoption. I think, um, in, in my opinion, uh, 90, well, 90% 90 of the vehicles on road are two and three wheelers. So, and largely these vehicles are operated by uh, low income population. Um, so there is a really, um, uh, I'll say difficult struggle in adoption because these are not people who would spend two, three thousand dollars without overthinking about it. So it comes down to really making that decision as simple as possible and the most profitable one for the driver. Um, there are initiatives uh, to lower down to lower the cost, uh, the prices of battery and uh, batteries in the last couple of years have dropped over thirty percent. So there is a really headway uh, in that direction. Uh, and that is where three wheels uh, comes in and makes a big difference because what we do uh, at the core is really having a lot of these um, uh, service providers on our platform. And because of the data that we collect at the end of the day, we can simplify this as much as possible to drivers, telling them which is the best vehicle to buy, which is the best service provider to be in, where is the best markets to operate their vehicles in, et cetera, et cetera. And that is really what drives adoption. Uh, but also that is the challenge for today. Great. Um, there are some questions in the Q and A. Uh, Olu, somebody named Aaron Douglas is interested in connecting potentially around work in Ghana. And Jeffrey, there are a bunch of questions for you, but I want to give Brennan a chance before we we go there. But I wanted to just point you to the Q and A uh, to, to look at some of those as sort of the last word. Brennan, I'm curious, you know, as the one person, as the one company here that is focused more on carbon removal rather than you know stopping what we're doing right now. Um, is that a barrier? You know, I, you know, how do you think about your impact? You know, is this more technology for the 2030s than it is for the 2020s, really? Um, I'm just curious in how you see that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So number one, actually, I'm, I'm not using my AirPods anymore. Do I sound okay? Can you hear me yeah. Well? Yep. Beautiful. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's absolutely correct, right? Like a ton of CO2 not emitted is far better than one emitted and then removed. Um, I think the unfortunate reality is, and you know, whether it's like you're talking to someone at the IPCC or someone at a sustainability group at a corporate, you know, at a large corporate, we're kind of actually past the point where we can either just reduce, and there's definitely no world where we just remove, unfortunately. We really have to do both in parallel. Um, and so for us, kind of going back to that climate equation, we, you know, I was talking about earlier, where you're reporting, reducing, and removing, we really view ourselves as a complement to all the corporate sustainability teams, where as someone who might work at, you know, uh, a manufacturer or, you know, maybe you're manufacturing windows or some, something else, you know your supply chain incredibly well. And so you're incredibly well positioned to begin the decarbonization of it. That being said, the idea of removing carbon is highly outsourceable where there is a right way to do it. And it actually lends itself incredibly well to scale economies and things like this. So we really view ourselves as complements to sustainability teams. Um, as a result, we've actually gotten an immense amount of pull 
from, from corporates. And specifically because we're an API first business, we're typically selling to technology businesses who on average index maybe a little bit more uh, liberal or aggressive when it comes to innovating and being on the bleeding edge, if you will. And so the actual reception to, you know, there's this complicated market, you put it in a language I understand, that's code and APIs and software, that's great. The rate limiter for us has actually been typically education. So now once you have that normalized view of the entire carbon ecosystem, there are a lot of different options, right? There are some things that cost $10 a ton. There are some things that cost 600 and there's all this other complementary metadata associated with it and helping people understand why those things are different and what is kind of the right solution for your company for the goals you might have has typically been your rate limiter. Now, thankfully, we're not the first company that's had to solve um, kind of like education with category creation with B2B software. That playbook's been written by whether it's Salesforce or by Algolia or all these other infrastructure businesses. So it's there's actually a bit of a playbook there, which we've been, we've been kind of privileged enough to kind of lean on and, and kind of replicate the new, in the new industry. Great. And and who is your typical cus customer? Somebody was asking, or or let me let's say your ideal customer. Yeah, our ideal customer uh, typically is someone who has an internal sustainability team and they want to be, and they're actively mitigating the footprint internally. So they're trying to reduce it, but they also want to complement it with removal. The second piece is they're type primarily technology forward. And so what that means is they understand how to write software, how to develop software internally, and they may want to incorporate it into a product or service they have, whether that's a credit card like a, with like a Neo bank uh, or um, you know, a crypto exchange or maybe an e-commerce platform. Great. And Jeffrey, last word for you. There were a bunch of questions for you. I'll, I'll let you choose which one to answer. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, I had answered a few in, in text here, but uh, maybe from Sarah, uh, who asked a few questions about uh, electricity production, how they compare to conventional solar panels, rooftop and large scale. Uh, so, the field. so essentially our, our tech, because we're not harvesting all of the visible spectrum of light, we're not going to be as efficient as a normal, you know, solar, uh, solar panel. So we're on average about a third to half as efficient as, you know, um, you know, conventional solar on a rooftop. Um, but if, on a side of a building, it's not nearly as important because there's orders of magnitude more surface area to go on a, you know, a side of a building than on a rooftop in a downtown that doesn't have any rooftop at all. So um, we are much more focused on aesthetics and integrating seamlessly into this product that goes into every building, um, you know, ever, and will always continue to go in buildings. That's our, that's our focus. Um, but yeah, to answer that question, we're about third as half as efficient, depending on the spec of the window, we can do different colors different, you know, visible light transmission. So we can be darker, lighter. And based on that, we'll be harvesting, you know, different spectrums of light and therefore, you know, producing more or less power. Great. And are you exploring trucks, buses, planes, uh, you know, kind of other other ways you could think about yes, getting into yes, glass? We, cer we certainly are. Um, the, the, there's about five or six um, glass manufacturers in the world. They produce all of our glass. They have, you know, building flat glass divisions. They have, you know, autom automotive glass um, that goes to, you know, you know like, the, uh, like OEMs that are working on this. So we're talking to folks in the automotive industry um, quite frequently as well. Um, our core focus, of course, is, is you know, buildings. That's what right. we'll launch into first. Well, we're at the hour. I want to thank our panelists again for sharing what you're doing, but um, for also mainly doing what you're doing uh, and, and fighting the good fight. Um, audience, thanks for joining us. Please take a second and uh, use the poll up here on the, the right and enjoy the rest of Urge. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it, Kate. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Kate. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.